So, thank you for being here, uh, letting me spend some of your time. Uh, it's not often that we have such a distinguished audience, for me at least, so I'm really happy to be here. I'm going to do this with a little bit of a, an MBA style thing, how we develop a concept and try and look at how it has implications for the way in which managers practice things. And I'm going to talk about how scope three and scope four, which are two measures of uh, emissions, how they will perform, how they will work when they start coming into companies, where in companies they will do what, and in what sense they will be inspiring things to do, and in what sense they will be inspiring us not to do anything. So it's, it's an attempt to say that measurement might be a fantastic idea, but let's try and follow where the measurement goes in order to see where the consequences are, or alternatively, where is it that the measurements, which we might have thought would be the solutions, become the problems that we have to deal with? So, uh, so this is uh, not my PowerPoint slide. Okay, I'll do it in, in this way then. I think the start, this, the, start is, um, the start is that sustainability is not an object. It's, it's an object in the sense that it has been stabilized when calculated or when thought about as a mechanism that brings together things, but it's typically or primarily an effect. It's some things we hope will happen. It's something that's, that's a program of hopes, it's a program of promises, it's a program of ambitions, but it's not a program of means. It's not a program of what can be done. We have heard today that many things can be done, but it's not a program that orientates or organizes means towards something. So it's, it's an ambition, 17 ambitions, 16 ambitions that we have for the world that have to be organized somehow. And the firm is there somewhere. Where is the firm? Well, it depends on what we can promise to do. Because most, at least the ones I will talk about, of the measures we have, for example, about CO2 or, or these sorts of measures, are measures that, where the truth is not sensorial. We know there's something called climate, but climate is completely a measured product. It's only a measurement, whilst weather, of course, is a sensor and sensorial thing that you can have on your body. So in a sense, you can have an idea of weather being represented by the climate that we have outside with the temperatures and water. But climate, climate is a set of sensors and a set of algorithms and a set of reports. So when we know there's something uh, wrong about climate, it's because we have calculated it. It's completely a calculation. And part of the thing that, so therefore, what we get as a problem is how can we, how can we promise something about a, a thing that is only calculation and nobody can feel it? It's even calculated in such a way that even if we have the IPCC as, as an as a expert group that does it, it has no management. Normally, in a, in a firm, we would say that the accounting system or the performance measure is related to somebody who is responsible. But for IPCC, climate responsibility is moving around the COPs and all sorts of other places where we don't know who can intervene and we certainly don't know who has authority on others. So therefore, we get the situation that we have a measurement, we have a tool, so to speak, but without any intervention. Really, there is no mean. There are no means. So what do we do in a situation where we have to take means into consideration? Because this is what we do through firms. We take means into consideration. What, does, what happens when you do that? And this is where I propose that this is partly an imaginary. I agree with that. But I think it's more of a promise. A promise has the properties about the future that it speculates about the future that will happen if we do a lot of things. It's always conditional. And it's always conditional on failure. Nietzsche tells us, many people tell us, promises are conditional on failures. And therefore, they're conditional on how the failure we produce will be received by others. Is it so that those failures can be forgiven? Hannah Arendt, can we forgive each other when we do things for the good but fail? Or the other, other side is that if we realize on our journey that we are wrong, can we, can we then forget in style? Is it okay not to be accountable? Is it okay to change ambition while we go on when we try and seep up what it is that we learn while we go on? So the promise harbors these two things. There's always the possibility of things falling apart, and we can either be met by questions of forgiveness or questions of forget forgetfulness. 
means that we shouldn't necessarily be accountable. We should take things seriously, but not literally. We should do things for people, but people will have to acknowledge that, they, that we do it for them, even if they fall apart. This is a difficult situation, but this is probably where we face the problem of emissions when we think about it in the world. Because emissions start to have their own travel when they start to engage with corporate life. And I'll give you these two small um, illustrations of what does it mean to have scope three and scope four. It, when they start to travel around the organization, where does it, where does it lead to? What does it do? When, what does it um, uh, put in place? And I'm only giving you stylized examples from my research because this is fairly complex, but I'm giving you a few stylized examples in order to show why it is that things like these things become managerial objects of interest for the future. So we have these CO2 missions, so I'm sure you know them, right? Nobody doesn't know them. I'm sure you couldn't say it if you didn't, but... Uh, and I'm going to talk a little about uh, an idealized form of scope 3 and an idealized form of scope 4. So, this should have been a PowerPoint presentation, it would have been uh, interactive and all these sorts of things, but uh, we cannot do this today, so I'll try and do it. We start here. It's about procurement and it's about a calculation. So this is what scope three is doing. So it, it tries to say that we have a procurement activity between a focal firm and a supplier firm, and that, that situation is filled out with activity. Uh, and all of these activities that we have have to be measured in terms of CO2 emissions. How do we do that? We go to the CHG. This is a set of scientists, as we know, we've heard that a few times. So we apply a standard rate for the industry to those uh, different types of um, activities that we've had. So we create on the basis of our activity an average number which comes from an institution that therefore creates an average number for us. We have an activity measure for us, but an average number for its translation into a uh, CO2 representation. So the first thing that, ha that happens is that um, we create these um, scientific calculations as scientific as, as standards. This is what we start by measuring. And, th and we say that this is really important because if we don't do it like this, how can anything be auditable? Now we have to remember here that CO2 calculations are not sensorial. They cannot be justified by what we can see. An, audit, an auditor cannot see it. Nobody can see it. We can only go to other institutions to claim that they have some credibility. So we go to these sorts of things. Now, the, um, So this is the first thing that happens. We need to do this. But then the procurement person says, well, what you're doing is to base everything we do on something that is invisible. I have no chance of knowing whether this is right or wrong. I don't know in what sense what you're saying is right. Rather, that, that particularly when we're in a situation where we are discussing with our supplier whether we could improve something. Make, for example, we have two types of improvements. One could be activity, could be reduce activities, fly less. The other possibility is that we could persuade the supplier to make more CO2-friendly flying with biofuels or something. There are at least two options. There's th at least two ways in which we can think about developing the relationship. But you can easily see right now, of course, that only one of them turns out to be interesting. Because what happens here is that if we have the same number, if we have the same number of, um, of uh, transactions, then the, CO2, the scope three measure will be the same, even if we have reduced the average CO2 emission per transaction. So we get into a situation where suddenly these people say, well, we cannot really do the measurement and we cannot really justify our, our in a sense, our investments in CO2 reductions because it shows up nowhere. There's no way in which it, because we use the types of measurements that we have in the classification, institutionalized classification. So what we have here, when at least the companies I talk to, that these procurement people are really in a complex array of finding out what does it mean for us to engage in CO2. Because whatever we do, we can never see it. Only if we reduce activity, but that might not be the point if we want to have a greener supply chain. It might be that we want to do other things because reducing, it just means that we insource it. It doesn't mean that we get rid of it, it just means that we insource it and make it a 
another type of scope. So the first thing that comes out of this idea is that suddenly, because of this way of calculating, innovation comes to stand in the uh, this calculation comes to stand in the way of innovation. So this is the managerial problem. If we start to move it around, if we start to emphasize it, then we start to have difficulties in envisaging this kind of world that we would like to have. It might be that it stands in the way of it altogether. So this is the first type of problem we get. And therefore, we get the problem that we can't really negotiate with the supplier about what, what has to happen if we want to do something about CO2 emissions. So the managerial problem becomes one of incredulity because the auditing problem becomes more important. Even if these people say, which they do often, we can find a better way of dealing with CO2. I don't know where they know it from, by the way. It's, it's difficult to get. They claim, at least, that they can, they can do better than the average. The average in this, in this scientific program, of course, has a, uh, outliers and things. I mean, if we can do better than those things, how can we not get these sorts of things into place? So the managerial problem related to, to um, these types of measurements is that possibly we will not get the innovations that we need because we measure. We wouldn't have done that had we not measured, probably, but because we measure in this particular style. So therefore, there is an institutionalized point about the that, that comes in, uh, into our firms, that certain things cannot be done. So innovation cannot be done because what we would do if we, in a sense, if we cannot show local gains, why would we inno innovate? And if we cannot show these things, then it's because of this. It's because of auditability we get problems in showing what it is about innovation that we're interested in. See, this is a managerial problem. Can you see that? A managerial problem that somehow has to be realized, has to be seen, it's behind the scenes. It's absent, in a sense, from the calculation, but it's a thing that runs out of it when we start to mobilize it. So this was a scope three point. Scope four point could be this one. Uh, there is a company, an Italian company called Autostrada, that creates motorways and things like that, and was probably the first company in the world to create toll automatic toll systems on motorways, so you can run through them and pay, pay without stopping. They had, a, they had a, a thing called a telepass, a small technology that they got, not because of CO2 emissions, but because some of their engineers had had the fortune to be part of Ferrari's Formula One team's office, and they, they, were, they were experimenting with telemetry and started to say, couldn't we use telemetry on these motorways. And they started to say, well, it could be useful because we had the problem of when there's an increased traffic on motorways, then we need more space for the toll booths, for all these uh, toll collectors to sit in. But space around the motorways is really, really uh, scarce. And if you can do it, it's really, really uh, expensive. So therefore, an alternative might be to say that we are not a company investing in space, but one that does something different. And therefore, they created that's one story about at least how they created the, the uh, toll system. Now, the point then, of course, at a certain point in time, toll systems became part of an agenda about CO2. And it became part of an agenda about how we could envisage what it, envisage what it is to do scope four calculations, which require a, a baseline for a situation that we would have been in without the investment, and then what would happen if we did something to do the investment. And they did, and they very quickly found out, of course, that suddenly they could, I don't think maliciously, but they could see that what they were doing could be put into an organization around emissions that was true and not wrong, but said something about the ambitions that we could have in order to create a, a motoring in a particular type of way. And of course, in order to do that, you need to document what, what you have to do. So they started to document it. So what, what happened in the toll booth is that you drive your car to the, to the toll and then slowly go through it. And they created, and this is a, four, a, 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 a scope four type idea, they created um, an experiment. Now, experiments are simulations. There's, there, there are simulations about conditions that we could imagine would be interesting, that are, have such a character that we could say something specific, but un under conditions or with conditions that themselves are quite Simple, they have to be simple, because otherwise we can't understand them. So what they did was to um, have two phases of going through a toll booth. The first one up there is without this uh, electronic device, uh, the, without the telepass, 
and they had some assumptions about the, the car coming in, going from cruising speed to 30 kilometers, and then to zero kilometers, and then up to 30 again, and then to cruising speed. And then for each of these phases, we could start to estimate what, what, what does it mean to have emissions on a car. And of course, when it, when it accelerates fast or for a long time, it seems to have more emission than if you don't do it. And that was the alternative situation, as you can imagine. So that's only two phases. One is you, s you decelerate till 30 kilometers, and then from 30 kilometers up. So they made the calculation about what happens if you only have two phases rather than three phases. And I'm not going to go with th this is a complex calculation, but it was ca a calculation. And I'm sure you can see what the consequence is that it is more eco-friendly to have the top. I mean, th this, is, this is already, of course, in the premise. But, but somehow this becomes what we have to do with the scope four thing. We have to create premises that say something about the past issue, and then we have to create a, a storyline about the alternative. But all these premises, of course, are imaginary. That could be, we don't think about, for example, how many of these cars will be electric ones. How many will be diesel? How many will be, come from a higher cruising speed or go to a higher cruising speed than the one that's allowed in Italy? I'm, I'm not sure they look at the signpost so much about the speed. So there, there are many realistic assumptions that are not part of it. And this is important because otherwise we can't justify what the baseline is. If we, produced, if we put more and more detail into it, it would just be so complex that nobody would, would understand it. So we then, with the scope four calculations, get into a situation that the numbers we ha have are simulations. They are, in a sense, creating something that is absent. They're creating an object of driving, the first one, that doesn't exist. It's absent. There's an absence to what happens. But it's necessary for us to do the next step, namely make it performative enough for us to say, yes, we invest some things in new toll booths or invest in how much, how much speed should you have? Should it be 30 kilometers or 20 kilometers or whatever? But the idea of the, of the calculation itself becomes a moving, moving object and becomes one of the mechanisms by which we try to later, of course, organize what driving is about, namely is it 30 kilometers or 20 kilometers or 40 kilometers or 80, whatever. It could be 80. If you, can do, if you, if you don't hit hit the booth, then 80, of course, would be the best. But there are some things that you would have to put into the calculation, into the arrangement, in order to understand what the consequence of a particular decision is. This is the types of things we need to do with scope four. So scope four becomes simulations. Scope three become things that hinge on averages that are existing outside. And suddenly we start, to, to, of course, to think about where is it then that we can do anything? Why would this make it possible for us to do some things? And of course, they do. They put things in motion. They do have uh, uh, tolls, and they do do things. Even procurement people do try and talk to their, uh, their suppliers about what this means in terms of uh, CO2, but not because of the measure, because of, corp uh, because of social uh, di discourse or because you have new people coming in who want to do this from, from university who've been taught that this is what has to be happening. So there are other mechanisms for doing it and not necessarily because there is a choice making behind it. It can come from so many other places. How, many, how much time have I got? Five only. Oh, I'm sorry for you. Um, so what we can say is that um, in a sense, we can say the scope ties simulate the supply chain beyond the firm, but in a particular interesting way, namely scope three produces average effects of inter-organization relations, but also therefore highly unclear incentives for uh, improvement, it says. And the second thing it does, it moves the entity of the firm as a thing, the, th the firm as a thing as a decision-making ob uh, obligation to the supply chain relation, which means that the firm, to some extent, becomes responsible also for your... Because the firm induces the supplier to do some things. So the firm induces, which means requires. But that suddenly means if we are going to improve our CO2 thing, by activities at least, then we have to help understanding how they do their investments. So investment planning something somehow suddenly becomes very different to what it was before because we have because we have this sort of idea. The idea of the telepath, okay, 
It could be that it helps us create a fluidity. It, it becomes easier to drive on the motorway, and no, when the cars drive the same speed, we have fluidity, which might be a measure is, is, um, is, a, is a target. Or, and that reduces uh, emissions per car. But of course, not necessarily from the motorway, because fluidity also creates other things. It cr creates a new demand for the motorway dri driving. So there will be more ca cars driving on the motorway, with each of them with less uh, emission, but the whole of it, if they, increase the, if they increase the traffic, of course it does something different. We don't know how much it does it because that requires a particular situation, but suddenly it could be that in decreasing, decreasing emissions increases them. Now this type, of, this type of dilemma is of course a managerial one. This is one about moving things together to su in such an extent that we can, we can live with them. So the question is where does this lead to, and I have five minutes? Four minutes. <laughs> I need to know what my controller says. Uh, now this, because uh, it's, it was a PowerPoint, so I would introduce elements from time to time. But I'm just trying to tell you that um, that there was the way in which uh, um, Autostrada puts time into this is by another mechanism. Um, so, so if okay, we can go through this in a moment. So this is the one I want to show you. So if we go over here, we can see what Autostrada talks about when it reports on sustainability. All the CD SDGs, and all of them have a, a, a procedure for increasing them, and all of them have measures. Fairly traditional GRI or ESG type things, which is, which is fine, which is a measure of what we do on selective or selected dimensions, often considered as independent, we can because we can delegate them. We do that as independents. But but um, Autostrada does something, other things, that, which is quite fancy. They have this idea, a new accounting system, and what this idea does is to say that we first of all we have to spend money for investing every year, even if even if we don't have ideas. So we have to spend money. And the things we have to spend money on, even if we don't have ideas, are these things. Safety, traffic, something, accessibility, fluidity. Which is, of course, a, a purpose, but it's not a grand purpose. It's what, in the old days, we would call use values. What is it about these things that would be good to a motorist? Accessibility, fluidity, safety, these sorts of things. And the question is, if, if we have a push towards use values, and we have a budget that is being required to being used. What do we get then? In this particular situation, they have to have this. This is an engine. This is not a performance management system. This is an engine. We push things through. And when they start to say, how can we do this? What do they come up with? Things that would increase fluidity and safety. Well, they get more of the telepaths. So it started to talk about uh, uh, advising advisor, uh, um, motorists about how fast to drive and these sorts of things. They also talked about other things, though. During the night, you could, they, would, they would signal that you can go into the, into the uh, gas station and get a free coffee. They also started to experiment with um, asphalt, where rain could not stop. I mean, de-raining, de de-water, de I don't know what it's called. Rain, for, uh, asphalt that would not go to this. They started to think about uh, noise reduction barriers. So what they did here was, of course, to make all this thing not a performance target, but a transformation into technology. They made it a different thing. Technology has this uh, opportunity that it transforms the world, it does something to the world, it changes what the motorway is about. It transforms things from being a measurement of performance to one about where we can lead technology into transforming our business. When accounting becomes an input, that's in a, in a sense a performative, then it becomes one of the mechanisms by which we reimagine what the world is. And will it be what we imagined it to be? What I'm trying to show here is that if we follow this, this is over 20 years. We start with telepathy in the middle, then we got a little more about how they, uh, how they informed motorists about speed and there would be traffic jams and there would be things. And they started to think about additions of things, asphalt and whatever that you could have. You can also see that they started to think about how this technology could help us in, in other countries. So they moved into other countries. They moved into urban spaces. They started to manage uh, uh, 
uh, parking lots in municipalities. Uh, they did many thin things. The point is that if we add to technology by some measure that has something that coordinates this idea about use value, then suddenly what comes out of it is a lot of transformation. And if we are required to invest, there will be lots of transformation. But whether anybody could p p predict this, whether ending in, in aerospaces in Brazil would have, would have been an imaginary sometime, is really, really difficult. The imaginary here, I suppose, is the principle of you do things by means of fluidity or other things that have a locality to it. But the effects of repeating localities can very easily become big and strong. Big, big at least. I don't know if they're strong. Big effects. That might be, so this is where the promise, what is it that we promise? <laughs> we promise to spend money. We promise to do something about the motorway, but even that promise can be broken because we also do something about muni municipal parking spaces or other places where this particular technology can also help us do something about emissions. So the point about if we follow the idea of accounting and, and um, is that it becomes performative. It starts to infuse, it does something that re it requires us to do. So therefore, in a sense, we can say that the promise of doing some things to to, to um, fluidity does hold things together, but it doesn't really control what comes out in the other end. That's imagination, that's, a, that's a creativity. But it holds things together because every year we have to spend money on these three or four use values. Um, you can say that the pathways to eco-sustainability may, I mean, this idea about we might have, we might have um, one car reducing its eco-footprint but if everybody does it, it might create the opposite effect. So there are, there, are, there are ambiguities in this thing. It may be that some of the things are good on one scale, but bad on a different scale. It could be, as it, I think it could be here, that, uh, that sustainability, which we thought about as, a, as an end, becomes a means. It's the condition under which we see how, how the telepass works, that we start to think about, is it 30 kilometers? Is it 40? Is it 20? Is it? it becomes a means for thinking about what the innovation is going to be. And if we think about uh, sustainability as a means, it becomes part of the production or the, the, the so-called hard, hard strategies of what we do. If it becomes part of the thing, then it's not a thing we report separately, but become part of the thing. So we sometimes hear that diversity creates Creativity. Diversity probably is also in fluidity. There are many things in fluidity that comes from the different compact goals. So perhaps fluidity suddenly becomes the thing that coordinates, that integrates, that does something to not the... Uh, so, so it transforms the accounting system from one about I show how good I am on different accounts to one that says how do I help produce the cake rather than distributing or sharing the cake, how we share it, then it's about how we produce it. Now, this is not the conventional idea of sustainability, but I think many companies, when they think about it, start to make it a, a knowledge problem more than a, a distribution problem. And perhaps that's where we are. So therefore, it may be that sustainability is not only ends, but it could be that parts of them are means. Have I still got some time? One oh, well, um, it's been good to talk to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Let's see if we have one or two questions to, for Jan. Mm -hmm. if, if I can start, I was curious about when you, when you talked about uh, how a calculation can stand in the way for innovation. Couldn't it be the other way around? I mean, oh, it, yeah, it, it, it can, I, think, I think it can, mm -hmm. in the sense that the calculation of fluidity will, will not stand in the way of innovation. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that the more we get, I, I, if we were to put it as a proposition, then the more, so in, in current society, the, the, the big, big problem about sustainability is that it's measured by institutions, outcomes. Uh, poverty, all sorts of things. Most of the targets that we have there are mi mi macro targets. Therefore, they have averages or other things that we need to deal with. And when they become, when they get this form, then it becomes different for, difficult for the firm to be different. And therefore, 
the innovation will not happen. It's, it's also what happened when actually accounting standards moved somewhat more to market-based. We thought market-based values of companies would make them different, but it didn't mm -hmm. so much because auditors could not recognize a company that's different. So therefore, we have something to, to recognize, and recognize is the average. So if we have too many things that are constructed institutionally, we will get the situation where they may stand in the way of innovation. Good. So thank you so much. I think we are, um, if I'm looking at the time, I think it's uh, uh, time for us to say thank you so much for Tion. Thank you so much. Thank you.